July 23, 1983, one minute until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. A red light starts flashing in the cockpit of Air Canada Flight 143. Captain Bob Pearson furrows his brow and taps the light, thinking it must be a malfunction. The warning light is indicating that fuel isn't being pumped into one of the engines. Pearson leans over to the first officer, Maurice Quintal. You seeing this, he asks? Quintal nods his head. It must be faulty wiring or something. I'm telling you, these new Boeings are full of kinks. Suddenly, the plane jerks. A series of new lights begin to flash. What the hell? Pearson says. He begins checking various dials and gauges. The engine on the left wing begins to whine as it slows down. This can't be right, Quintal says, holding the flight manual in his hands. Everything that is happening indicates we're out of fuel. The plane begins to lose altitude. There's another jerk, and the right engine sputters to a stop. We're going down, Pearson yells. Find me a place to land. Three months before Flight 143 runs out of fuel. All right, Bob, let's try out the next scenario. The training officer for the new Boeing 767-233 says, Your right wing engine has failed. What do you do? Pearson goes through the motion step by step. He adjusts the throttle, compensates for the loss of power, and begins a controlled descent. The trainer ticks off a series of boxes on his clipboard. Nice work, Captain, he says. Bob Pearson smiles. He loves flying and has logged countless hours behind the flight stick. However, his passion is gliding. He is one of the most talented gliders in the country, so it's only natural for him to ask this next question. What is the protocol if both engines go out? The trainer pauses. That would never happen, he replies. I mean, I guess if the plane completely ran out of fuel, it's possible, but that'd be really bad because all the electronics run off the power generated by the engines. The pilot would basically be flying blind. That's why we have a number of fail-safes in place to make sure there's always one engine running. Bob Pearson nods his head. Sounds simple enough, as long as the plane has fuel, there's no reason to worry. But he's still curious. That makes sense, Pearson says, but what if both engines did go down? The flight trainer looks him dead in the eye. It'll never happen, so we don't run through that scenario in training. Pearson lets it go, but he can't help but feeling that it could be a fatal mistake to not have at least a protocol in place if both engines stop working. However, he's just a pilot, and somebody else gets paid a lot more money than he does to make these types of decisions. July 21st, 1983, two days until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. In September of 1981, the Boeing 767 flew its maiden flight. Sea Gone, the aircraft that would be given the designation Flight 143 in the coming days, was the 47th Boeing 767 to be built and had been flying for four months. Since its introduction into the fleet, 55 changes needed to be made to the Master Minimum Equipment List, or MMEL. What the MMEL dictates is which systems are inoperative on the aircraft. This might sound crazy, as most people would think every system on the plane should be working before it takes off with passengers, but this is not the case. When Flight 143 took off in the coming days, this list would indicate some pretty important systems were not operational. July 22, 1983, one day until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Come on, a technician says while deep inside the belly of the plane. He pulls out a faulty sensor in the fuel quantity indicating system. It's been giving pilots troubles for days. The only way to be sure that the aircraft had enough fuel to reach its destination was by doing the refueling calculations by hand. These new 767s are pieces of junk, the technician says, tossing his tools in the truck. He takes out the aircraft's logbook and creates a new entry. The technician continues his routine maintenance check, a little annoyed that things keep having to be fixed on this aircraft. Little does he know the inoperable sensor will be one of the key factors which leads to this very plane running out of fuel and plummeting to the ground within the next 24 hours. July 23, 1983, 12 hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Captain John Weir and Captain Donald Johnson walk through Edmonton Airport toward their gate. They're scheduled to fly to Toronto and then to proceed to Montreal. They smile at the flight attendants as they enter the plane. When they get into the cockpit, there's a clipboard with several updates written on it. The two pilots begin conducting their pre-flight checks when there's a knock behind them. Good morning, gentlemen, a technician says. I got good news and bad news. Which do you want first? The two pilots look at each other. Let's start with the good news, Weir says. The technician tells the pilots that the plane, for the most part, looks good, and the forecast calls for clear skies. Then the bad news comes. Last night, the techs found a faulty fuel sensor, so we'll need to take manual readings using the dipstick. The pilots shake their heads. It's not a great way to start the day. But the worst part was all the calculations and conversions that needed to be done by hand. Rather than just reading the fuel gauge, the pilots need to use pencil, paper, and a slide rule to ensure they had enough fuel to make it to their destination. Of course, Weir and Johnson had been trained to do this, and it was a requirement to become a pilot, but manual readings left room for human error, and in the coming hours, disastrous errors would be made. The readings from the dipstick were taken and converted correctly, 
everything was recorded in the flight log before the plane was fueled and ready to leave Edmonton for Toronto. You're all clear for takeoff, have a good flight. The control tower says over the headset, Captain Weir pushes the throttle forward, the aircraft lurches. The G-Force pushes pilots and the passengers back into their seats as the 100-ton metal bird rises to the sky. Passengers look out their windows as the cars and houses below become nothing but pinpricks on the vast Canadian landscape. July 23, 1983, eight hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Liam slams his fist against the blaring alarm on his bedside table. It's early afternoon in Montreal, but he's still exhausted from his night shift at the factory. He's been putting in extra hours to save up for his trip out west to visit Elk Island, Banff, and several other national parks. It's always good to get out of the city and spend time in nature, and he needs it now more than ever. His engagement has been called off after his fiancée got offered a job halfway around the world to pursue her goals of providing medical aid to those in war-torn countries. Liam encouraged her to make her dreams a reality, but in doing so, they both knew a long-distance relationship would never work. He reluctantly let her go to make the world a better place, with a broken heart but pride for what the woman he loved would accomplish. About a year later, Liam booked his trip, and now he's looking forward to exploring part of Canada he's never been to before. Liam gets out of bed and finishes some last-minute packing before making his way to the Montreal airport. Six hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel, Captain Weir gently lowers the 767 onto the tarmac and engages the brakes to slow the craft. It's a clear day. During his descent, he could see the skyline of Montreal in the distance. He lets out a sigh and stretches his neck. That's it for today, he says to Johnson. Both pilots are done with their shifts and will be staying in Montreal until the following day. The plane taxis to the gate and comes to a stop. The sounds of seatbelts unbuckling the moment the captain turns off the fastened seatbelt sign echoes through the cabin. The passengers grab their bags and proceed off the aircraft as the flight attendants and pilots thank them for flying with Air Canada. Weir and Johnson gather their things from the cockpit. You want to grab a drink at the bar before heading to the hotel? Johnson asks. Weir nods his head and the two pilots disembark making sure to thank their co-workers who've already begun cleaning the cabin for the next set of passengers. Liam sits at the gate and watches two pilots walk through the jetway and exit the airport. They approach two men dressed in the exact same suits and hats with the Air Canada logo on them. The pilots stop and talk to each other for several minutes. Liam looks up at the sign above the entryway to make sure he's at the right gate. It reads, Flight 143 with service to Ottawa and Edmonton. He waits patiently for the announcement to line up and board the plane. 5 hours and 45 minutes until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. The avionics technician enters the empty cockpit of Flight 143. He reads a logbook and notices there have been several notes written about a faulty fuel sensor. Just to make sure that the sensor itself was the problem, the technician turns the system on so the FQIS can perform a self-test while he waits for the fuel truck. The test fails, just like it said in the logbook. Piece of junk, the technician says as he closes the MMEL. He's about to turn off the system and return it to the way he found it when the fuel truck arrives. The technician rushes out of the cockpit to tell the fuel team about the sensor problem and that they'll have to wait. However, a fatal flaw is made. The technician never goes back to disengage the FQIS system after the failed test. The fuel gauges are now blank, making it seem like the system was never turned on and masking the fact that the technician was running a test. Five hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Mom, we're going to be late if we don't leave now. Sophia yells up the stairs to her mother, who's still getting ready to drive her to the Ottawa airport. She just finished up her master's degree in environmental science and conservation and decided to treat herself to a little time outdoors before applying to jobs with the parks department. Her plan is to explore some of the wildest places in Canada. She's starting her journey a little further west in Edmonton. Sophia impatiently taps her foot as she hears the creak of floorboards above, signaling her mother is once again going to check her outfit in the mirror. Mom, you look great, let's go! A slightly muffled voice says, You can't even see what I'm wearing. I'm going to try on one more outfit. Sophia slaps her hand against her forehead and paces back and forth. She hates being late to anything, but especially the airport. She's someone who is always at least three hours early to her gate just to make sure that if there are long lines or traffic, she has plenty of time to spare. With each minute that passes, Sophia gets more and more anxious. I'm calling a cab! She yells up the stairs. Her mother appears at the top, still putting on an earring. All right, I'm coming, I'm coming, she says. Thank God, Sophia replies. She grabs her bags and heads out to the front door to the car. Before she hops in, she checks one last time to make sure she has everything. She reads her ticket and looks at the flight number. It says Flight 143. Four hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Captain Bob Pearson and First Officer Maurice Quintal continue their pre-flight check. 
Their flight plan has them stopping in Ottawa, where they'll pick up more passengers before continuing to their final destination in Edmonton. Pearson reads through the notes left by the previous flight crew. When he had passed Weir in the airport, the previous pilot had told him about a faulty FQIS sensor. Pearson leans over to Quintal and shows him the note. This is what Weir was talking about. We're going to have to calculate the fuel by hand. Pearson taps his finger against his lips as he thinks. Let's load this bird up with enough fuel to get us all the way to Edmonton. We're already behind schedule. It'll save us a few minutes if we don't need to wait for the fuel truck in Ottawa. Quintal agrees, and they start running the numbers to figure out how much fuel the tank needs. Unfortunately, now that everything needs to be done by hand and double-checked, the flight is becoming more and more delayed. Pearson gets a dipstick measurement of the fuel levels. The fact that the plane is relatively new throws him off from the start. The 767s require that all fuel slips be written in kilograms per liter, while every other aircraft is documented in pounds per liter. Without thinking, Pearson uses the conversion that he's been using on other aircraft. The first mistake happens when Pearson converts the 7,682 liters of fuel in the tank to 13,597 pounds of fuel instead of kilograms. And since one pound is only 0.45 kilograms, that means that his calculations are off by over half. The computations show that in order to make it all the way to Edmonton, the plane would need 8,703 kilograms worth of fuel, when in actuality the tanks need 16,131 kilograms. When all said and done, the order for fuel should have been for an additional 20,088 liters. However, Pearson only orders 4,917 liters, which is exactly how much the fueling team puts in. Unknown to everyone working on the plane and the flight team, they'll have enough fuel to reach Ottawa but not Edmonton. Their only hope is that someone will realize the mistake before Flight 143 takes off from Ottawa. However, due to another series of unfortunate events, no one will notice the fuel tanks are not full until it's too late. Three hours and 20 minutes until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Sophia runs through the Ottawa airport toward her gate. She has a terrible feeling that when she reaches the plane, the doors will be closed and the flight team won't let her on. She rounds the corner. I'm here, I'm here, she shouts. The Air Canada representatives standing at the desk look at her in confusion. They point up to the sign above them. It says, Flight 143 has been delayed. Sophia lets out an exhausted breath and sits in a chair facing the window so she can watch the planes take off and land. She had plenty of time, but to her, being less than an hour early for your flight is the same thing as being late. Three hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Sorry about the delay, we should be getting underway shortly. Flight 143 was supposed to depart 20 minutes prior, but due to the fuel system being inoperable and the necessity of doing the refueling calculations by hand, they're behind schedule. After a few more minutes, Captain Pearson gets the all clear from the refueling team and the technicians. Plane is ready for takeoff. All right, Kintel, let's get this show on the road, Pearson says. They conduct one last round of checks and maneuver their craft toward the runway. At 5.30 p.m., Flight 143 takes off from Montreal and flies toward Ottawa. It'll be a quick flight, and the plane will only be at cruising altitude for a handful of minutes before they begin their descent. Liam looks at the empty seat next to him and briefly thinks about his lost love. Then he shakes his head to clear the thoughts and looks out the window. He kind of wishes there was someone sitting next to him just to talk to. He isn't the biggest fan of flying, and company would be nice. But maybe when they land in Ottawa, someone will take the seat. Two hours and 15 minutes until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. The airplane rolls up to a stop in Ottawa. Since the flight was already behind schedule and the pilots believe they have enough fuel to reach Edmonton, no additional fuel is added. A technician takes a dipstick measurement and glances at the pilot's calculations. Seems like everything checks out and therefore doesn't do a more thorough investigation into the faulty fuel system or the fuel calculations. The Ottawa passengers joining the flight begin boarding the plane. Sophia walks down the aisle looking for her seat. Now that she's on the plane, her anxiety has been greatly reduced, and she has an easy smile on her face. She proceeds further toward the back of the craft and spots her robe. There's an empty seat next to a man looking out the window. His elbow is on the armrest, jutting out into where she needs to sit. Excuse me, sir, Sophia says. This is my seat. A soft voice breaks Liam out of his daydream. He turns away from the window to see a woman standing in the aisle looking at him, but she isn't exactly looking at him so much as his elbow. He looks down and sees that he's leaning into the seat next to him. Oh, I'm sorry, Liam exclaims. He slides over so the woman can sit. She plops down next to him and lets out a heavy sigh. Oh, I didn't think I was going to make the flight, she says out loud. Good thing you were delayed in Montreal. Liam smiles. Yeah, we were sitting on the tarmac for a while, but I guess they figured out whatever the issue was. I'm Liam, he says, holding out his hand. The woman takes it and shakes. Sophia, it's nice to meet you, Liam. The last of the passengers take their seats, and the flight attendants close the door. 
Captain Pearson is given the go-ahead by the flight tower. The fuel gauges are still blank, but he doesn't even give them a second thought. The engines roar to life and Flight 143 lifts off into the air. The plane starts to rise slightly sooner than expected, as if it's lighter than it should be, but the pilots just chalk it up to an updraft or something similar. There is no indication that in the next couple of hours, things are going to go terribly wrong and Flight 143 will plummet toward the Earth below. One hour until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. The hum of the engines fill the cabin. A baby coos near the front of the plane. Flight attendants walk up and down the aisle offering beverages and snacks. Toward the back of the plane, Liam and Sophia are talking. I can't believe we're all visiting the same parks, Liam says. Maybe we should just travel together and save on gas, Sophia replies. She's only joking, but there is a part of her that finds the man sitting in the next seat fascinating and not wholly unattractive. I mean, it would make sense, Liam says with a laugh. Ever since Sophia sat down, the two haven't stopped talking. They both have an intense love of the outdoors and have chosen to spend their hard-earned vacation time exploring national parks. One of the flight attendants comes by. Can I get you to anything? She asks. Maybe a glass of wine? Liam looks at Sophia. Sure, why not? She says. We still have a few more hours to kill until we get to Edmonton. The flight attendant walks away with a smile on her face. These two wouldn't be the first passengers she's seen meet on a plane and leave together. The flight has been smooth. The sun casts an orange glow through the windows. Seems as if this will be a pleasant flight for everyone. 8.02 p.m. Two minutes before Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Captain Pearson and First Officer Quintal sit in the cockpit, talking about the previous year's hockey season. Quintal looks out the window and sees Red Lake, Ontario below. The plane is cruising at 41,000 feet or just around 12,500 meters. A buzzing sound fills the cabin. Quintal looks around. Pearson sees a series of blinking lights. Everything is indicating that there's some sort of fuel pressure problem on the left side of the aircraft. You think it's just another malfunction? Quintal asks. Pearson looks at the different warning lights. Ah, it's probably just a failed fuel pump. We should be fine. The engine can be gravity fed since we're leveled off. The pilots flick a couple of switches and the buzzing stops. In the cabin of the plane, no one is even slightly aware there is a problem. Liam and Sophia continue to talk. Businessmen sleep. Parents keep their children entertained. In the next few minutes, everything will change and screams will fill the aircraft. 8.04 p.m. Flight 143 runs out of fuel. A different alarm in the cockpit begins going off. This time it's indicating there's a problem with the right engine. Ah, this can't be coincidence, says Quintal. Pearson looks at him and grabs the yoke. The only way both engines could have pressure issues is if we are out of fuel, Pearson says. What's the closest airport we can land at? Quintal pulls out a series of maps and charts. The engines are still running, but lights are flashing through the cockpit. It's clear something is very wrong. Winnipeg, says Quintal. If the engines keep going for a little while longer, we can make it to win. At that moment, the left engine fails. The plane lurches. The flight attendants know something is wrong. This is not just some sort of turbulence. The sound of the left engine can be heard winding down. The plane begins to descend. The passengers aren't quite sure what's going on, but there is a palpable fear starting to fill the cabin. The head flight attendant makes their way toward the cockpit. We lost the left engine, Pearson shouts just as the flight attendant opens the cockpit door. She stands there with a look of horror on her face, but immediately falls back on her training. She closes the door and informs the rest of the cabin crew. All right, let's prepare for a single engine landing. We've been trained for just this kind of situation, Pearson says. Quintal nods his head and starts radioing the tower in Winnipeg that they've lost an engine and will be conducting an emergency landing. As Quintal is relaying his message, Pearson tries to restart the left engine. It sputters, but won't start up again. A new siren begins to blare in the cockpit. The pilot's worst nightmare has come true. The siren signals that all the engines are out. Then there's a sharp bong that neither pilot has ever heard before, and everything goes dark. 8.06 p.m., two minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. The passengers now know something is wrong. The lights in the plane have gone completely out, and the sound of both engines has been reduced drastically. The 767 was one of the first airliners to run all of their electronics and flight instruments using the power generated by the engines. This wouldn't have been a problem if there was one engine still running. But that's no longer the case. Passengers begin to scream and children begin to cry. The flight attendants try to keep their cool as they tell everyone to fasten their seatbelts and remain calm. The plane jerks back and forth. It's falling from the sky. Liam looks around, trying to figure out what's happening. He unbuckles his seatbelt and stands up. Sophia grabs him and pulls him back to his seat. Buckle up! I think we're gonna crash, she whispers. Liam's eyes are wide. He's never been so scared in his life. He rebuckles his seatbelt and looks at Sophia. She holds out her hand. He takes it. She squeezes tight. Flight 143 descends to 35,000 feet or 10,700 meters. It's losing altitude fast. Pearson holds tightly onto the shaking yoke and tries to keep the plane level. Quintal has informed Winnipeg they lost both engines. 
He looks at Pearson. I don't remember this being covered in training, Kintal says. It's because it wasn't, shouts Pearson. This wasn't supposed to happen. Kintal grabs the emergency manual, looking for the section that contains the checklist of things to do when both engines go out. He's disheartened to find that no such checklist exists. The pilots are operating in the dim glow cast by the few instruments that run on their own batteries. Everything else, including their screens, sensors, and warning lights, went off when the second engine failed. 8.07 p.m., three minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. I can't move the yoke, pedals, or any of the levers, Pearson yells. When the power went out, the hydraulic systems used to multiply the force of the pilots so they could operate the heavy machinery of the aircraft from the cockpit became disabled. Now, no matter what either pilot does, nothing will budge. For a moment, Pearson is filled with terror as he no longer has control of the plane. There's a loud clunk from the fuselage. When the power went out, an emergency ram air turbine swung out from a hidden compartment. This turbine drives a hydraulic pump that reinstates the power supply to the hydraulic system. The controls in the cockpit begin working again. 8.09 p.m., five minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Flight 143 continues to descend toward the ground. All right, I can do this, Pearson says out loud. He thinks about his experiences as a glider pilot. Those crafts are much smaller and lighter than a 767, but he could use the same principles to hopefully bring this behemoth of a plane in for a landing. In order to give them the best shot of making it to Winnipeg, Pearson calculates the optimum gliding speed for a 100-ton passenger plane in his head. This has obviously never been done before, so he does the best with what he has. I'm going to try to slow us down to 220 knots, Pearson says to Kintal who's still using charts and maps to identify the best place to set the plane down. Kintal gives him a thumbs up and speaks into his headset. We're changing our speed to 220 knots, Winnipeg. Please be advised we're coming in hot without any engines or power. Kintal unbuckles and proceeds to the cabin full of frightened people. We have a fuel problem, he tells the head flight attendant. We're going to land in Winnipeg. Kintal turns around and rushes back into the cockpit. The flight attendant informs the passengers. Liam looks out the window and sees nothing but trees and natural features. They are nowhere near Winnipeg. His stomach sinks. Liam turns to Sophia. Her eyes are closed. He stares at her for a few seconds. When she opens one of her eyes, she squeezes his hand again. We're going to be okay, she says. Liam pauses for a moment. If we make it out of this alive, can I buy you a coffee, he asks. Sophia smiles. I would like that, she whispers. 8.11 p.m., seven minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Kintal grabs Pearson's arm. I don't think we can make it to Winnipeg, he says. I've charted it three times, we just don't have the altitude. Kintal points to one of the mechanical backup instruments that's still working. He used the aircraft's radar echo from Winnipeg to determine the plane had lost 5,000 feet in 10 nautical miles. At that rate, they'd fall well short of reaching the Winnipeg airfield. I'm going to look for an alternative, Kintal shouts. Just keep this bird airborne for as long as possible. Pearson makes slight adjustments to give Kintal more time. He's flying by feel at this point as all the instruments to help guide the aircraft are either dead or useless without electricity. He cranes his neck to get a look at the landscape below. He can tell that their descent is faster than he hoped. All Pearson can do is keep the plane steady until Kintal finds an alternate landing site. 8.12 p.m., eight minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. A large group of people is camped out at Gimli Motorsports Park getting ready for the races in the coming days. This particular event is being hosted by Winnipeg Sports Car Club. Campers and RVs are set up along the tree line and pond. Hot dogs and burgers are being cooked on open fires. Kids run around playing tag, while the adults relax in their chairs and sip on drinks. The festivities at the park are supposed to be one of the best of the year. Cars and drivers from across the region have converged at Gimli to compete or just watch the action. There's a road race course, a go-kart track, a drag strip. At the moment, none of the courses are being used as the events have ended for the day. Gimli's a perfect site for the event as it used to be an airfield for the Royal Canadian Air Force. After it was decommissioned, the auto clubs took over. Little did anyone know that the airfield was about to become operational once again, and everyone who was there would be in grave danger. 8.14 p.m., 10 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. I think I've found a place to land, Kintal says to Pearson. There's an old decommissioned Air Force base I used to fly out of not too far from here called Gimli. It's within our flight path should be abandoned unless it's been repurposed for something else, but as far as I can tell from the map, we should be able to make it." Pearson adjusts his course slightly to line up with the airfield. Kintal relays his new plan to Winnipeg and tells them to send emergency services to Gimli. The air traffic controller confirms the request. No one at the Winnipeg control tower has any idea the airfield is being used for a motorsports event. 8.17 p.m., 13 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Kintal runs his fingers over the different switches on the dashboard, looking for the correct one. He locates the lever to force a gravity drop of the landing gear. 
When the hydraulic system went out with the rest of the power, the pilots lost the ability to lower the landing gear. To remedy the situation, a gravity drop forces the locking mechanism to mechanically unclamp and the landing gear to free fall into position. Sophia hears a loud bang and the sound of rushing wind under the floorboards. She looks at Liam. I think that was the landing gear, she says. Liam looks out the window. The landscape is much closer than when he last checked. People all around him are either praying, yelling, or holding onto their armrests for dear life. It'll only be a matter of minutes before they are either safely on the ground or engulfed by a raging inferno as the plane is ripped apart on impact. The rear landing gear is down and locked, says Quintal, but we have a problem with the nose wheel. For some reason, it's not locked into place. There's no way for the pilots to fix it or try again without power, so they just hope for the best. Pearson shouts back to the flight attendants, prepare for an emergency landing. This message is relayed to the passengers and everyone holds on tight. 8.19 PM, 15 minutes after flight 143 ran out of fuel. Pearson can now see the runway they're aiming for. It looks like there's some activity in the area, but he hopes it's just emergency vehicles who are there to come to their aid. He glances outside the cockpit window to try to get a reading on their speed. It becomes clear that the plane is approaching the runway too fast, and if they don't slow down, they'll overshoot their target. Without hydraulics or power, there's no way to extend the flaps to slow their speed. Maybe we should fly a circle around the airfield to slow us down, Kintal suggests. Pearson shakes his head. The plane doesn't have enough altitude to complete the full maneuver. I'm going to try something I do when I'm gliding, Pearson says. He shifts the controls so that the rudder is going in one direction and the ailerons are pointed in the other direction. This is known as a side slip and causes the plane to increase drag while decreasing altitude at the same time. The controls tighten up as the air being forced through the ramjet decreases. Pearson has to put all his strength into straightening the plane back out in preparation for the landing. He grits his teeth and pulls hard. 8.20 PM, 16 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. The campers at Gimli continue to play golf, ride bikes, and cook dinner, unaware that a passenger airliner is careening toward them. The sun is still above the horizon, as the summer months receive a lot of light this far north. There's no way for anyone to know that the plane is approaching, as without working engines, the aircraft makes very little noise. Everyone at the decommissioned airfield continues to enjoy their evening, as Flight 143 comes barreling toward them. Are those kids on bikes? Kintal asks, pointing ahead of them. The plane is only a thousand feet or 300 meters off the ground. Get out of the way, kids! Pearson yells, even though he knows there's no way they can hear him. He pulls back on the yoke and glances out the window. He sees the boys looking up at the plane with their mouths wide open. This is it! Pearson yells, there's no stopping now! 8.21 PM, 17 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. People at the motorsports event scream as the 767 crashes into the ground and begins sliding toward them. People on the plane yell in terror as they're thrown against their seatbelts from the impact. Liam holds Sophia in his arms, hoping they can make it out of this alive. Pearson and Kintal slam on the brakes as soon as the wheels touch down. The plane skids along the decommissioned runway. The front landing gear gives and the nose of the plane slams into the ground, sending sparks and smoke flying out from the metal scraping against the concrete. A guardrail that was constructed to separate the two sides of the drag racing strip gets caught under the nose of the plane. The screeching of metal on metal fills the air. This additional friction helps to slow the plane down. Ahead of the nose, Pearson can see a large group of RVs and campers at the end of the runway. If they don't stop, this plane will slam into the group of people and vehicles, causing immense death and destruction. He grits his teeth harder and pulls back on the yoke. Flight 143 continues to skid along the runway, crashing through the barriers. The group of campers is getting closer and closer. Two of the plane's tires explode causing the metal casings to scratch against the ground. The plane is almost at the end of the runway. The campers are only 1,300 feet away, 1,200 feet, 1,100 feet, 1,000 feet. Suddenly, the airplane comes to a stop. It rocks back and forth before settling. The nose has been crushed, and the landing gear is mangled. The smoking fuselage rests on the ground. Pearson opens his eyes. He doesn't move. Suddenly, he hears applause erupt from the main cabin behind him. The passengers are thanking the flight team and cheering the amazing flight skills of Captain Pearson and First Officer Quintal. They saved everyone's lives and managed to stop the plane before it hurt anyone at the motorsports festival. 8.23 PM, 19 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. The emergency hatches and doors of the plane are opened. Since the front landing gear failed, the entire plane is on an incline with the tail high up in the air. The flight crew deploys the emergency chutes and the passengers are helped down. Sophia steps out of the hatch, jumps, and slides to safety. Liam is right behind her. When he reaches the bottom of the slide, Sophia is waiting for him with her arms outstretched. They embrace for a moment, then proceed to the side of the runway. The people camped around the decommissioned airfield race to the plane, 
to provide any help they can. Emergency services are on their way. No one is pushing or shoving to get off the plane. The worst is over, and the passengers exit in an orderly manner. The last people off the aircraft are the flight attendants and the two pilots. As ambulances and fire trucks arrive on the scene, a few of the passengers with minor injuries are treated. Everyone else waits to be brought to Winnipeg, where they'll be put up for the night by Air Canada. Sophia and Liam stand hand in hand as fire crews spray the nose of the plane with water to cool the metal hull. She turns to Liam and looks him in the eyes. How about that coffee? She says. They both laugh. There were over 60 passengers and 8 crew members aboard Flight 143. Everyone survived, and there were no serious injuries. Captain Robert Pearson and First Officer Maurice Quintal were heroes. However, an investigation into what happened to the plane did uncover the mistakes made when calculating the amount of fuel necessary to make it to Edmonton. July 25, 1983, two days after Flight 143 ran out of fuel, the aircraft is repaired right on Gimli Airfield and flown from the decommissioned airbase to Winnipeg, where it underwent a rigorous set of repairs and maintenance work. In the coming months, the 767 will return to service and continue to fly Air Canada passengers until it's replaced by an updated model. After the investigation concludes, Captain Pearson is demoted for six months, and First Officer Quintal is put on a two-week suspension for their roles in the incident. Three maintenance workers who worked on the plane that day were also suspended. However, in 1985, both Pearson and Quintal were awarded the first-ever Fédération Aéronautique Internationale Diploma for outstanding airmanship. They had saved the lives of everyone on Flight 143, and their quick decision-making and admirable flying saved the plane itself. During the investigation, several attempts to replicate Pearson and Quintal's success in landing a 767 without any engines were carried out in simulations. Every single test resulted in the plane crashing. What Pearson and Quintal had done was nothing short of a miracle. Both men continued to pilot aircraft for the rest of their lives, expectedly always double-checking their fuel levels before takeoff. Now watch Malaysian Air Mystery, what we now know about missing flight MH370, or check out what happens when you break the sound barrier.